Hello, Sackville. Year 11, mainly, I think, and 10. How are you? Uh, happy holidays. I hope you've had a chance to catch up on some sleep, maybe. Uh, perhaps feeling slightly less tired than you were at the end of uh, the end of last term. Um, there are some questions to be thinking about. Any of these you can pick out for me at all, do we think? Um, yes, I hope all is well. Um, still a week and a half to go. Maybe slightly optimistic, but that's where we are. Um, so these are the these are the questions you might get at the start of paper one. These is all about memory, really, isn't it? And what stores what? So anyone got any ideas for any of these guys at all? Um, stores address where memories read, stores frequently used instructions. Any idea on those at all? Any any ideas? Just stick them in the comments for me and we'll see what we get. I'm not quite sure how many millions we're going to have in today. We'll have to wait and see. Um, we had quite a good turnout last week, so let's see who we get in this time. Uh, right, well, I can't see anyone here, so what I'll do, I'll crack on with a little bit of teaching, and then we'll see what we get after that. That's probably a good plan. Right, let me get rid of this. And that's that. Okay, so let's see uh, any, any answers at all on this one. And let's see if we can... Uh, if we can encourage one or two of you to join in. I'm not quite sure how many of you there are online right now, but we can soon find out. Well, what I'll do, I'm going to go on and do a little bit of teaching of this topic, and then we will go from there and see and see what's going on. There, there are a couple of you here, so um, don't worry about the, uh, about the quiz. If we can't do that now, that's not a problem. And actually, it's not a bad thing because... Uh, we have got a huge amount to do today, so I'll crack on. Um, but I can see there are a few of you here, so I'm glad. And I'm quite impressed, really, because it's it's your holidays. And uh, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, is to uh, log on to YouTube and listen to someone talking about computer science. So I'm going to whiz through these and not do these now. And instead, I'm going to jump straight into today's, today's theme, which is the ethical, legal, cultural and environmental impacts of digital technology. Now, it's a mouthful. It's also a bit of a weird topic. Well, it's not a weird topic, but it's a weird topic in the context of everything else that you've done. Think about paper one, which is mainly about how things work, and paper two, which is a bit about how things work and a bit about programming. And then you've got this topic, which is IT in the world discuss, which is a bit of a challenge, really. And they break it down into these four areas, uh, ethical, legal, cultural and environmental. And they will ask you an eight mark essay question on this area. So why should you care? Well, you should care because this is a formula that if you learn, you can actually do really well. It's also an eight mark question. And in the grand scheme of things, eight marks equals one grade boundary. So if you can nail this question, it might make up for weaknesses elsewhere, and it might also increase your grade. Um, this is this is a sort of area that students generally do quite badly on, and we'll try to identify what you can do to make sure you hit the top mark band in these. You haven't got to be an expert. You haven't got to be great at writing English. It's just about how you structure your answer. That's the important thing. So... We'll now look at this in a bit more detail, and we'll start here. So we know that technology, and when we discuss technology, we are talking about computers and uh, the sort of technological age, going back to the days of the, uh, of the Ark and Moses when I was a young man, there weren't any computers. I mean, there were computers, but they were inside science labs or offices. No one saw them. No one had computers. If you went to the doctor, all of your records were paper. All of your, the, the, the driving licenses, everything was paper. There, there, was, there, wasn't, there wasn't technology supporting everything that, that, that we do, as there is now. And this, this whole area is, is looking at technology and seeing ways in which it's improved and ways in which it's made our life worse. And I, and I guess the steps and the, the laws that are there to protect people. So that's kind of what this is about. But it's a bit of, a, it's a bit of an IT in the world discuss type question. So it, it, it's, not, it's not that straightforward. So the issues are, we know that, we know that IT is useful, that, that, that technology is really useful. But it does provide um, some issues, particularly around privacy 
ethical issues, legal, cultural and environmental. And don't worry if you're thinking, what's the difference between ethical and cultural? We'll go into that in a minute. So hopefully inside your mind palaces, you will have this idea of, right, these are the four or five things I've got to talk about. I've got three or four things for each of these that I can kind of adapt to the question they're going to ask. I'm going to answer both sides. I'm going to write enough. I'm going to do some planning and I'm going to get out of there with between six and eight marks. And, and I think most people can do this. You haven't got to be an expert in IT and have read all the tech journals to, a, to, to, to get a good mark in this one. So the wider impact of technology, and we'll look at stakeholders and uh, environmental issues as well. The environmental issues are actually an awful lot easier, to be frank with you. You'll find that you know most of these anyway. Fret not. I do not intend going through every item on this page. Ooh, that reminds me. I've created a knowledge organiser, which I've put on this YouTube site. Um, I made a post that came out at six o'clock, which is three minutes ago. So you should be able to find um, this. And in fact, this is a part of a sort of A3 knowledge organiser that I made. It's there for you. So just take the picture, download it and print it off. OK, so it's there for you. If you can't, let me know and I can send a copy to uh, Mr. Vladi Godfrey. OK. Right, so first thing is, how do digital technologies, what are di digital technologies? Well, the examples we can think about are the web and digital media. And what I've got here on the, um, let's have a look here, on the, on the left-hand side here, we have got all of the, I guess, the definitions of the different types of technologies there. And then on the right-hand side here, we've got examples. Now, I don't intend going through all of that now because it would be very tedious for everyone, including me. But you might want to look through that and just remind yourself about the the variety and the range of different technologies there are out there and the sorts of areas, the applications, the way in which these technologies are used. So I think that could be that could be quite useful for you. All right. I think interestingly, we've obviously got web, which relates to e-commerce. We've got digital media, which relates to music and books and games and movies. We've got uh, communication with chat bots and voice interfaces and so on. So there's plenty of ways in which we actually use technology. We use it every day. Um, and in fact, I mean, our phones we use for absolutely everything. OK. So step one is that when you are presented with this question, they'll give you a scenario and you will have to produce an answer. It's worth eight marks, so you've got about 10 minutes to do this. One of the ways that is really useful to sort of break into this, this is why I've got the padlock here. I hope you appreciate this. The padlock here, this is why it's there, is to remind me to say to you that this is how, this is how you can actually unlock this question, okay? So... To unlock the question, think about the different stakeholders that you've got there. So this is how you unlock the padlock. Who are the people involved in whatever issue they're talking about? Is there a company owner? Are there employees? Are there members of the public? Are, are there people who work in the retail outlets? What about the suppliers? What about the local community? Um, what about the customers? What about the government? So the, one of the ways you can split this open really quickly is to think about all the different sorts of people that are involved and how whatever the issue is impacts them. And part of your planning time needs to be spent thinking about the stakeholders. This will, of course, depend upon the question at hand, but you need to really focus on the stakeholders. It's a great way of breaking a question open. So the stakeholders are anyone anyone involved in the issue in any way <clears throat> and by spending a bit of time thinking about the different stakeholders you can often break into the different issues that might be impacting them so then we've got the environmental issues and this is actually relatively straightforward because this relates obviously to the uh, natural world and the impact that digital technologies have on the natural world so things like and this is the point at which I need to say to you, go to uh, on my YouTube site where you are now. If you Google green IT, I've done a couple of videos for Cambridge Technicals, which is the sort of the A-level IT course. And it's just about green IT. And you might want to watch one or two of those just to remind yourselves about what the carbon footprint is, um, you know, what, what, what the uh, climate change summits are about and just how that whole area is being managed by governments at the moment. And that will give you some, some ideas that you can actually use in your essay. 
Okay, so the key areas you might want to think about in terms of the environment are the energy consumption. There was a question a few years ago about whether or not you should purchase a new printer because the printer that was the new printer was more um, economic, was 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 more um, used less electricity um, and was therefore cheaper to run. Um, however, you needed resources to build the thing. It, it involved plastic, it involved the electricity to actually make the product. So you had to weigh up the pros and cons of that. So that's the energy consumption side of things. Then you've got e-waste, that when we finish with our phones, what happens to them? Well, if you can't sell them, they end up in landfill. And then there's sustainability. It's building things to last rather than building things so they get chucked away. Built-in obsolescence, what's very interesting um, in, in, in a way that things have changed since I was a kid is that things were bought and then repaired whereas now things are bought and chucked away and new things are bought and that is it's a much better system for companies because they can make more money which is of course why they have this built-in obsolescence it means that things break after a certain period of time I mean I think the washing machine that we had when I was a kid I think we had it for 20 years I don't think we've had a washing machine to last four or five years since I've been an adult so that's an example there and then you've got recycling. Can the materials that you're using be recycled? So there are some ideas, and I'll go through some more of these later on, in how you can, how you can focus your answers on uh, the environmental issues. And of course, with environmental issues, um, think about electric cars. Electric cars are great, but what about if the electricity is actually comes from, uh, from, from old-fashioned power stations that burn fossil fuels? Well, that's pretty bad, isn't it? So there's all sorts of areas, but I think environmentally, it's actually one of the easy things to talk about, landfill, about toxic waste and so on. And I'll cover those in a bit more detail later on. Then we've got this one, which is a bit more thorny, I think, which is ethical. And we've got ethical, cultural and legal. So ethical relates to what people believe is right or wrong. But this excludes a legal framework. So there's not necessarily a law that would make it wrong or would make it right, but it's considered by people to be unacceptable. So, for example, going to a shop, trying on a pair of trainers to find the right size, leaving the shop and then ordering it online and paying 10 quid less. Is that ethical or is that unethical? That You wouldn't get put in prison for doing it, but is that right or is that wrong? And that would be a case of arguing the case, wouldn't it? Um, now, often there are, there are more sort of formulated ethical um, systems. So, for example, there are ways that you're supposed to behave as a policeman or as a lawyer or as a school teacher, or as a doctor. Um, there's a code of practice that you follow. If you break the code of practice, it might fall short of breaking the law, but you are breaking uh, an, an understood, laid-down code. So things can move from ethical to legal, but once once they fall into the legal domain, then there is a law that's being constructed to manage it. Okay, So that's the idea of ethical, what's right and what's wrong. Then we've got privacy. Uh, privacy is something that they will ask you about. I reckon that that's... That I think I'm 50-50 on whether they'll do something on electric cars or something on, on privacy. But they, they do love a privacy question. And this relates to keeping your data and your personal matters secret. So you think about all the data leaks, people losing their details, so then that'll lead to identity fraud and so on. That's the sort of areas we're looking at there, is how your information is looked after. And we go into GDPR a little bit there, okay? So we're jumping back to ethical issues now. And this relates to what people believe to be right or wrong. So, for example, um, new technologies bring certain safety concerns and safety concerns about about personal data so for example interestingly privacy i think falls naturally within ethics so if you're asked to write about an ethical issue privacy is always a good one to go to um, so for example cctv cctv is everywhere but do people want to be filmed? Is it OK that people are filmed? How long should the images be kept for? What purpose should the images be used for? All of these sorts of questions um, are really key when it comes to, uh, to cameras. Cultural. Cultural relates to how people behave how humans behave and of course if you if you go to different parts of the world people behave very differently um, and so this is why you've got different markets the european market for selling things the african market the middle eastern market and so on so all of these will have different customs and different traditions all right so it's about how a society behaves 
what culturally is and isn't acceptable. So the digital divide is one, is one of the areas that you can possibly talk about when it comes to cultural issues. And this is the idea of those who have access to digital technology and those that don't. <clears throat> so, for example, if you're applying for a job now and you don't have access to the Internet, well, you're going to struggle. Going back 30 years, it wasn't a problem because you would, you would you would buy a newspaper and you'd look at it and then you would send off your CV to, you know, to, to the company. Whereas now, if you don't have broadband, if you don't have a device to access the Internet, if you don't have um, a good deal of bandwidth and actually a good amount of data, it could be that you're at a disadvantage when it comes to getting a job. Um, it tends to be those who are who have less money and those who are um, much older who struggle with the digital divide. Um, and also it can link to where you live. Example, you live in East Grinstead, I live in Brighton. We've got a pretty good IT infrastructure. If you lived in uh, South Wales in a village 30 miles away from, uh, in, in a farm 30 miles away from the nearest village, you might not have broadband at all. And no company is going to install broadband for one farm because it would never pay for itself. Um, so sometimes people can be technologically disadvantaged just because of where they live. Think about parts of Africa that don't have any access to the internet at all, and they're using satellite phones, and they're very expensive, okay? And also think about how work has changed um, over time to allow people to work from home, and that's a positive, isn't it? Think about uh, over uh, lockdown, over the coronavirus, um, over that time when we were all at home and doing some kind of teaching and learning not very good teaching and learning, but some kind of teaching and learning using technology and how that's changed the way that people behave. And think about how many people, so many of my friends haven't actually gone back to work full time, lucky them, since um, lockdown, because their companies have, have sort of realised they get as much work done at home and actually they haven't got to pay to heat offices, they haven't got to pay to um, uh, for the lights they might be able to sell off some property. So for the companies, it's quite useful. On the other hand, they want to keep an eye on what their employees are doing. So it's a, it's a sort of a double-edged sword, if you like. Right. Now, I'm hoping that you by now have found that um, the image that I put there for you. But if not, don't worry. This is a very simple word cloud that covers some of the benefits of technology. And I'll just sort of work my way through a few of these so you can understand um, how this actually works operates. Where do we start? So the good things about technology. So first of all, we've got the, um, I've got this one up here, which is called improvements in industry. And I was thinking there, let me just highlight that one for you. Uh, that's this guy over, let's go to here, improvements in industry. That's this one here. And I was thinking about farming, about ways that technology has enabled farming to become far more efficient. So it can put more food on the table for less input. Um, safety people feel much safer with mobile phones um, what about a 24-hour access um, that's what the internet's given us it's given us 24-hour access to certain resources employment opportunities getting jobs what i talked about earlier if you're selling something the internet gives you a massive global audience you're on ebay selling some old games and actually someone from america might buy them um, the internet's technology is reliable it doesn't make mistakes like human beings it can make things far more profitable because you can do things faster using technology. It can save lots of money. It's the same thing, isn't it? Um, it means repetitive tasks can be done really easily because computers do them much more efficiently and, crucially, much more accurately. There's less waste. You've got more choice. So all of these ideas you might be able to find a way of weaving them into your essay. But the essay you do, you've also got to link it back to the issues they raise there. You've got to actually answer the question and make sure that your answer fits the scenario. Um, why do they put democratic there? Well, I put democratic there because you've got somebody who is sitting at home and is putting out a TV show for you guys. If I wanted to do this 30 years ago, I'd have had to have gone to the BBC to do it. But now anyone can do this. And that's good and that's bad because some of it's very high quality. Some of it's pretty rubbish, as you know, from looking on YouTube. Um, it's more efficient using computers. We talked about e-commerce down here. The fact that you've got a global marketplace. As a customer, you can get competitive prices. Think about all the holiday um, sites like Trivago and um, Expedia. 
where you can compare hotel prices with 100 other hotels and you can get the best price. You can access more information. Um, you can, what else can you do? You can work remotely. For disabled people, the ability to communicate um, using technology is, 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 is life-changing. You can remain up to date with technology in a way that you can't um, otherwise. Think about hazardous training. So if you're working in a nuclear power plant, they can make a simulation that you can use rather than putting you in danger. It's scalable. The internet is scalable. So you can have as many people looking at a website as, as you would like. And it helps to make new discoveries and increases productivity. Lots and lots of arrows. So those are some ideas that you can use when you are trying to discuss the benefits of technology. And that's kind of half the course or half of this topic. Then we go on to the issues, the drawbacks of technology. So for that, we have got the following ideas. If you are in your 70s and you're going to the doctor, you don't want to be talking to a computer when you get there. You want the personal touch. Think about um, e-cars, e Google cars. You might not want to be driven around by a robot. Um, there's this terrible pressure to have the latest tech. And it might be that your company, your, your, your organisation, your sports club need you to own the latest tech to be able to take part. Technology is expensive. The, when it's thrown away, it produces toxic waste that's thrown into a landfill, it leaks into the ground, it poisons the earth. It's incredibly wasteful. Um, Built-in obsolescence, there's my favourite phrase, making things so they get chucked away, so they buy new things. And then all this stuff ends up in landfill. And sometimes it gets exported to Africa. We ship a lot of our old computer waste to to the African country who will pay the less for it and the least for it, and they just dump it. And then little kids go through all the stuff. They they go through the phones. They try and take out the the uh, you know precious metals. They get poisoned. There's no health service there. So it's all really really quite sad. Um, social pressure to keep up. The health issues of spending too long staring at a screen. Eye strain, neck strain, and there's this addiction as well with gaming. Um, hacking is your data really safe? We've got farming where they will send you off to a, um, a fraudulent website. The social divide, the haves and the have-nots. Um, phishing, where they might try and scam you, uh, making you click on a link from an email usually. Fraud, again, having your having your um, your data stolen, that covers that one too. Cyberbullying. I mean, we all know what the WhatsApp groups, I've gone back to being head of year seven this year, and the WhatsApp groups, the cyberbullying that goes on there is, it's it's really awful. Then you've got illegal content being housed there, um, both sexual and politically illegal stuff. Um, finite resources, phones, all contain really tiny amounts of gold, nickel, platinum, really precious precious metals, which are finite. There's only a certain amount of those metals in the earth. Lithium is another big issue, and we use that to make all of our batteries. Lack of durability, things break easily. Uh, the demise of the high street, the high streets are in some towns and cities they've died because it's cheaper to shop online goes back to our ethical question about if you go to a sports shop and try on their shoes do you feel compelled to buy them when you know they're 15 20 quid cheaper elsewhere um people become de-skilled uh so for example stonemasons who would have built cathedrals and would have built fancy buildings that's all done electronically now is it done to the same standard no but it's cheaper uh, and it's more scalable and it's more predictable um, and devices being sent to landfill. Cyber harassment I've put there, and data theft, illegal content. So all of that. So these are you know, some of the areas that you can talk about when it comes to uh, the negative side of technology. Uh, and again, use the um, knowledge, organi knowledge organiser I've given you, and that will hopefully become a little bit clearer. This is from the knowledge organiser, I'm not going to go through it because I've just done that, but that's uh, a list. I only wanted to point out to you that over on this side here, you see these, I've put little codes. So, by the way, the green means good. These are positive impacts for society. The red means bad, OK? So where I've put CU, that's cultural. ETH, ethical. ET is... Um, 
ethical, legal, environmental, that's ethical as well, uh, environmental, environmental, ethical, CU cultural, LE legal. So I've tried to give you an indication of which area each of these covers. I mean, I couldn't possibly write a list that covers everything, but if you've got a few examples for each of these and you go into the exam with these ideas inside your head and you do some planning, you should, you should nail this answer, really. OK, so I'm going to push on. Where are we? It's 25 past. Yeah, that takes longer than I thought. I know that you're not going to do quizzing, so I'm going to rush past that because you're not going to do that now. So I will get to the next bit here. All right. The legal side of it. You need to understand how current legislation relates to um, computers. So again, going back to the time of uh, Moses and the Ark, when there were no computers, surprise, surprise, there were no laws dealing with computers. Quite logical, isn't it? So if you think about the corollary of that, it means that when, when computers arrived, people started to, to do criminal things with them. So therefore, they had to have laws to actually deal with those things. Um, so this is what you need to know. So the first thing is uh, the... Let's go back to here... The purpose of each piece of legislation, I think that's actually quite easy. Uh, the second part is about software licensing. It's a, a few a few areas you need to understand there, but it's not too bad. Uh, open source software, proprietary software, that sort of thing. Um, the difference between those two and to recommend a license for a given scenario. Um, so we will jump through those now and have a look at the legal and the ethical side of things. These are the three laws that you need to understand. You do need to know what the date of the laws is. Sometimes they, they take up a mark for it, sometimes they don't. So it's, it's helpful if you know that it's the Data Protection Act 2018, Computer Misuse Act 1990, and Copyright Design and Patents 1998. And then we'll look at the software licenses. So, as I mentioned earlier, computers have created new crimes because their criminals will always find new ways of committing crimes. Um, so examples of those could be uh, things like illegally uh, sharing personal information uh, or stealing financial information, usually for financial gain, and then illegally copying and selling films, music and TV programs, and then extortion and blackmail. OK, so those are some of the key areas which uh, which legislations had to be drafted to deal with. The All of these things happened before computers, but since the advent of computers, it's become much easier to do these. So they've drafted legislation to govern how people should use their technology, their computers. OK. All right. The DPA, the Data Protection Act. Um, this covers your personal data, and this links into the ethical side of things in terms of privacy. So this covers your data, so your photos, your account details, your social media posts, your medical records. And this also includes GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation, which you do need to have a working knowledge of. Um, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail later on. Um, and the basic idea is that the organisations that look after your data have to do it safely. And there's a set of guidelines they have to follow, which I'll jump into in exactly two seconds. Right. <clears throat> data protection. So what does it do? It controls how your information is used. Um, and these are the principles down here for how you should um how you should treat data if you are a data holder, someone who's responsible for holding other people's data. And these are the, at A level, for IT, they have to learn this list, that the data that you collect is used fairly lawfully and transparently. In, in other words, if you, so you, I don't know, you, you buy a new product and you, and, and they say, join us, give us your, Give us your email address and then um, we'll, we'll, we'll extend your warranty by a year. So you do it. At the point that you give them the, your email address, they must tell you what they're going to use it for. And it'll usually be in writing that you don't read and click OK or accept at the end of it. But they should do that. So secondly, the data they collect should be used. If they tell you how they're going to use it, they must use it in that way and not in any other way. Um, which kind of covers this one here as well. Also, 
they need to make sure that your data is kept up to date. So if you were to have an account with somebody and they've got your personal data, they should write to you every 12 months to say, are your, are your details still accurate? You don't reply, and then they leave the details as they are. Um, also, that the data is not kept any longer than necessary. And organisations like the police have quite strict rules, not they always stick to them, about how long they should keep data for. Um, and that the data should be handled securely. So, for example, um, protecting the data by putting it behind a password or encrypting it. Those are ways that they could uh, keep your data secure. Three of you still here. Very impressed. Very impressed. Uh, but, 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 right. Computer Misuse Act. Um, this one is, I find this one easy to, to think about as this is like old fashioned crimes. This is what you would normally consider a crime. Um, of course, the other stuff is it, it, is is a crime because it's it's protected in law. But this is what you might more easily um, sort of consider a crime. So things like um, hacking into a computer system, that is clearly a crime. And that's covered by the Computer Misuse Act that says that if you do hack into someone's system, you're liable to be uh, to be prosecuted and there's, and there's a, a set punishment for it. Um, and this applies to all data. So, for example, they sometimes do um, a tick box question where they'll give you a scenario and say, a secretary who has stolen her boss's records and given them to a competitor. Well, that's covered by the Computer Misuse Act. OK, so... Um, that's what's related to here in the Computer Misuse Act. Here's a bit more detail. And again, this, I'm not going to spend ages on it because this is on the knowledge organizer that I've shared with you. It's in the community section of my website somewhere. If someone does find it, um, let me know. It was supposed to go live at six o'clock. Uh, what's the purpose of the Computer Misuse Act? It's to protect the confidentiality, integrity and availability of computer systems. Um, and there are various offences under this act. Things like, and let's just do this one here. Things like um, uh, unauthorised interception. So that's stealing people's data. Uh, false publication of data. That happens an awful lot. Think about any election. Uh, cyber harassment, uh, which is where you use your... You, you use technology to harass people, to bother them, to send them hate messages, to threaten them, that sort of thing. Um, again, that happens quite frequently. Cyber squatting, you might not have heard of, that's taking over someone's website. Um, cyber terrorism, this is what all governments don't do, but probably do. Um, and that's ways of waging war using computers, bringing systems down, gaining access to... I don't know, to uh, utilities like water, gas, electricity, uh, misinforming people before elections, that sort of thing. That would be cyber terrorism. Identity theft, stealing someone's um, data, f making accounts in their name, taking out loans in their name, credit cards, that sort of thing. Uh, it's quite, quite good business, that. Impersonating others. We talked about phishing last time. This is where you would um, click on a link on an email and get taken the email looks like it's it, it it's uh, reliable, genuine, but actually it takes you to somewhere that will try to uh, rob you of information. Fraud, forgery, etc. Okay, yeah, that's a good enough list there. So that's what these things cover. And the Act requires the service providers to assist in, in investigating the offences, and there are hefty crimes for getting that wrong. Okay, so that's Computer Misuse Act. So make sure you're happy with what the act covers so if they give you a scenario you can think oh yeah that's going to be the misuse act oh no that's that's gdpr okay um so then we come to the last one which is copyright designs and patents i think this is easy because this is the one that one that we all know about because we get reminded of this each time that we watch a film and it always slightly bugs me that you um you pay for a film and then it lectures you at the start about how you mustn't uh, mustn't make copies of it having paid for it very irritating. But anyway, um, so this applies to uh, software, to software, to games, to music, to ebooks, and all of all of that is protected under copyright law. And it's illegal to copy, to transmit, to hold copies, to copy someone else's code. It's it's stealing, isn't it? Um, what was that thing? You wouldn't steal a car. 
so why would you steal a film? Uh, so this, a bit more detail for you. So it protects the key phrase here, and it's worth highlighting this, is this notion of intellectual property. And intellectual property is the time, money and effort that someone has spent to make something. So for example, if someone took a copy of my video and made millions of pounds, I'd be very irritated because they did it rather than me, But um, and it's very unlikely. But, but I should have the right to make money from it, not them. It's my intellectual property. I spent time making it. Okay, that's the idea there. So who does it cover? Authors, composers, people who make stuff. Okay. Um, uh, why? Because they invest time and money in, 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 in making their output and they need that money to live. And the purpose is to make sure people are rewarded for their endeavours and to protect the copyright holder if someone tries to steal or make money or, off their work. All right. Then we get to software licences and this is open source versus proprietary. An open source uh, piece of software, an example you may have come across is Firefox, uh, OBS, which is a streaming software. I use a piece of software called Ecamm Live, which is great. It works well with, with Macs. Um, I could do it for free using OBS, uh, open broadcast software. It's absolutely fantastic. It's a bit of a pain to learn, but there's a huge community that, uh, that work together on this product, releasing new updates, uh, releasing new modules, releasing add-ons, helping each other. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous thing. Um, and that is open source. And open source means that you can get in and copy and share the source code. The source code is the is the actual program code. If you think about any Microsoft products, any Apple products, any products that you buy, you can't see the source code. You just use the program. You've got one copy of it. That's all you're allowed to do. You can't go in and change the program. But if you've got an open source software, you can do that. So you get updates from the community. Um, however, and that they could ask you a question about pros and cons of these different softwares. Softwares? Software. Mm, it's like fishes, don't need plural. Um, it's often the case that open source software, the testing may not be as formal. So it might, you, so for example, if you've paid £50,000 for a Microsoft license for a school and your, <clears throat> your version of Excel stops working, you can ring up and say, this doesn't work. I want this fixed now and somebody will fix it. If you've got open source software, well, no one's getting paid to do it. So somebody might help you sort it out. But if you've got a problem, you may well have to end up dealing with it yourself. Um, and of course, the problem with open source software, as I discovered with OBS, which is fabulous, by the way, and worth a play with because it's free, but it's also quite difficult to learn. And I rather arrogantly sat down and opened the software and thought, right, oh, OK, I've got no idea where to start. So I had to go and watch YouTube videos to figure out how, how to use it. It wasn't that hard, but, a, um, but it, you couldn't just sit down and play with it straight away. Then you've got the opposite, which is the proprietary software. You can't copy or modify. There's a cost for the license. You get support from the manufacturer and you get updates. Um, and the software, well, it says the software is thoroughly tested. It should be thoroughly tested. Um, and it's simple installation. But usually, of course, the problem with it is there'll be a cost and you can't modify it. So if they do a pros and cons of different software licensing, there we have it. And I'm guessing you figured this out, that the plus means it's good, the minus means it's bad. And the plus or minus means you could argue the case both ways. All right, so that's just software licensing stuff. Um, uh, a bit more detail here. <coughs> which I'm not going to go through because I've covered it because you've, you've already got a copy of this. But they may well, because they mention this in the specification, ask you, and I'm looking at this little box on the uh, left-hand side here, this guy. They might ask you, they might give you a scenario and say, Alicia has a software company and uh, she wants to sell pictures of her dog online. Um, she's got no money. What's, what software license would you recommend? And you'd probably say, well, she could uh, have a proprietary piece of software made that'd be very, very expensive. I recommend she uses the open source software because there's a big community of people who will help her and she can learn and build her um, and build her business. And also, um, if something goes wrong, well, it's not the end of the world because it only just started up. So that sort of thing. So I reckon they might ask you a question on that. 
Any questions, by the way, just shout them out. I can see the comments. No comments today. Um, where are we? 39. I'm going to stick a quiz up here to see if anyone... There are two of you here. See if anybody wants to answer a question. And if not, I'll push on. It's not... Um, it's not a deal breaker. In some ways, I'm quite pleased. I'm, I'm surprised that anyone's here, to be honest, on a Thursday in your holiday. So well done to you guys who are. Um, but if you want to answer that, I'll give you a second or two. Slow mode is off. Chat away. And I turned off slow mode. All right, so yeah, this is uh, radio silence, so I shall push on and just get those done. Boom, 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 boom. Here we are. Ooh, 20 minutes left. I've covered this. I've covered this quite quickly. Um, I have made a video which is on my YouTube channel, which is, I think it's entitled um, Tackling the Eight Mark Question where I go through, it's very similar to what I'm about to show you. So if you want to go and look at that afterwards, um, it's it really just gives you uh, some ideas about how you can tackle this eight mark question. So I'm going to run through that with you now. So we we spent the first two thirds of this going through some of the information that you could you could discuss. OK, and now we'll look at the uh, the extended writing task and think about how you could go through this. We'll look at the fact of the task, why it's tough. Have a look at the mark scheme. And therefore, that'll enable you to prepare for it. We'll think about a battle plan and we'll talk our way through a question. This really, if you if you cast your eyes down here, you can see that this is from this is I've, I've copied this from an OCR mark scheme somewhere. And can you see the raw mark where it says max mark up here? Right. Max mark. And then you've got uh, you've got the grades nine, eight, seven, blah, 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 down to the grade we don't want on the right hand side there. And this is out of 80. So when you're, because your exam's out of 80, you've, you've got two papers, the paper one's out of 80, paper two's out of 80, which gives you a total of 160. See the quick maths there? And you can see, the reason I highlighted this is look how grade seven is 56 and grade eight is 62, which means that all you need to go from grade seven to grade eight is six marks. Whereas this question is worth eight marks. And my quick maths tells me that this question's worth doing well in because it's a lot of marks, six marks. And you might undo some of the horrors that you might, you might uh, encounter in paper two in some of those algorithm questions that we'll look at next week um, by really getting a good answer down for this one because you there's a formula for this. So we'll go through what the formula is. Why are these questions tough? Because you're sat in an exam room on a wobbly chair with a wobbly desk with a see-through pencil case trying to uh, think about the rest of your life and you've got to answer this question and it's an eight mark question that's that's that, that's that's difficult if you don't plan it it'll be a nightmare it's also a difficult question these are regarded as being medium to high difficulty these questions so they've got low difficulty medium and high these are these are medium to high difficulty questions you're worried about time, you're stressing about time, you don't look at the context, you don't take time to read the question carefully and think about what, what it's really asking you. You don't look at both sides, pros and cons. Um, you start to, you, you start writing really quickly, you start rambling. Um, I can tell um, where I teach students, the English department, I've always taught them to use the word furthermore. So once the first furthermore comes into the essay, I know at that point it's just waffle. They've got nothing else to say. So they haven't planned. They've just written down everything they can remember and they start writing, furthermore, moreover. It's like, oh, you've run out of things to say, haven't you? So plan this. It's really important. Poor structure is a massive issue in these questions. If you take the mark scheme, which, by the way, for this question is the same every single year, it's eight marks, there are three bands, low, medium and high. To get in the high band, I think it's between six and eight marks. The medium band is three, four, five. And then below three is the low is the the low scoring part of the band. <coughs> the three the three areas that you need to really tick is that your answer is thorough. You've you've considered the context and the scenario. 
because you, you guys have figured this out. This isn't a question of write down everything you know about computer science. It's in relation to this specific question. And you've got to argue both sides. So those are the three key elements to you succeeding. OK, you should go and do a bit of background reading. Make sure that you're ready. Make sure you know your laws. Make sure you've done a bit of work on the environment. Maybe go and watch my video on green IT. Um, make sure you're happy with software licenses. Um, have a look at that list that I've done. Um, and that should be, that should take you most of the way there. Um, so then prepare your answers for each strand and think about the range of stakeholders. So I'm going to tell you some timings. Stick to your timings. Learn your checklist. Oh, yeah, I should explain this. Um, this is here because every year I have at least one student who is a political activist. They, they have lots of opinions, as people do. And obviously, I don't care. And nor does the examiner. I, I had a student who, um, whenever he... And he was a smart guy. He was a grade 8 student. And he, he, he hated Donald Trump, which I can understand. However, nobody cared... And he always managed to find a way of talking about the horrors of Donald Trump in his essays. And guess what? His essays sucked and he got no marks for them. So no one cares whether you want to save the world or whether you want to destroy the world. We just care about you writing a good essay. Obviously, don't destroy the world. But do you understand? The important thing is that you actually answer the question. No one cares what you think about Rishi Sunak or the other one. No one cares. No one cares. Um, here's the battle plan. I've put this in, uh, in, in, in camo, so I hope you can see it, right? This is in DPM, disruptive pattern material. Here's the battle plan. You're looking at this and going, yeah, great. How am I going to do nine things in eight minutes? These are simply a list of ideas you can have in your head, and I'll go through each of these in turn. I mean, the first one isn't exactly rocket science. Read the question. I mean, I'm guessing you were planning on doing that anyway. But I'll go through these in order. Read, highlight, refine, divide, brainstorm, categorize, link, sides, and write. And that's my kind of checklist. And I think if you go through your essay and make sure you're covering all of those, you'll be in really good shape. All right. So first thing is read the question twice. This is a question that I wrote about Cognautics Limited, who design, design self-driving electric cars. They have created a taxi that can do the work of five taxis at half the cost of a manned petrol car. Discuss the environmental, legal, cultural and ethical implications of this development. What I would do at this point is pause and then just read the question slowly and deliberately again. And by the end of that, that will have taken you around about 90 seconds, OK? But don't forget, you've got 10 minutes to do this. It's an eight-mark question. I think you've got 1.1 1. 1. 1 something uh, mark per minute, or minute per mark, rather. So you, see, you can have 10 minutes for this question. If you take 11, it's not a problem. But your planning time should be two-thirds of that, OK? So you should be spending a good six, seven minutes planning this before you actually start to write out your final answer. So I'd read this for a second time. And then we'll go on to the next thing, which is to highlight the key points. So you want to reduce this question to its simplest form. What are they actually asking? If you immediately go to writing the answer, you're not going to capture the essence of the question. You're just not going to do it. So you need to do this extra, this extra job. So what are the key things in this one? Well, obviously, self-driving cars, the fact they're electric as opposed to being powered by petrol or diesel. Um, this is important. The work of five taxis and half the cost of manned petrol cars. Oh, there's all sorts of things going on inside my head here. Electric cars, yeah, good for the environment, but not good if it's if if the electricity has come from coal powered power stations okay uh but not petrol so that that's good um okay half the cost that means that that the customer will be paying less that's good but hang on that means the taxi drivers aren't be doing so well out of this are they mm, okay what else is important here um environmental legal cultural and ethical okay so now i've sort of highlighted those i can reformat this question in its simplest form which is Discuss the legal, cultural, environmental and ethical impacts of a self-driving e-taxi that does five times the work of a manned petrol taxi at half the cost. That's what it's asking me. And then I'm thinking, what, what do I need to do here? I need to, I need to make sure that I answer the question. So I'm talking about 
I'm going to talk about taxes. I can't just talk about about the environment and 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 hugging trees and um, the fact you know I can't talk about that. I can, but I need to talk about taxes. So these are the important things: talking about the taxi, thinking about who that's going to impact, legal, cultural, environmental, ethical. Okay. Uh, by the way, my question is about a third the length of the OCR ones. The OCR ones are very, very rambly. I don't know why they do it. They do make their questions ridiculously long. So cut your questions into paragraph headings and you can use these for your answers. So I'm going to do a little paragraph on environmental, one on legal, one on ethical, one on, one on cultural and one on the stakeholders. So that is what I'm going to do. I've now divided this up into six mini paragraphs. And uh, I, can do, I can do that in, 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 in the time. I'm going to have more to say on some things than others, but I can talk about all of those things. Right. So you've read the question twice. You've taken out your highlighter. You've highlighted the key things. You've, you've, you, you've broken this down now into the key, the key areas you've got to cover and make sure that you are responding to the scenario. E-taxis, e-taxis, e-taxis. That's what we're focusing on here. So brainstorm your ideas. Focus on those four or five different um, areas we talked about and spend 20 or 30 seconds or 45 seconds just writing down everything you can think of that could link to those. And if you write this um, somewhere on your question paper and don't cross it out at the end. Because although it does appear that markers, uh, exam markers are employed by the devil, in fact they are told to mark positively. They want to give you marks. So if you are if you don't quite finish your essay or you don't quite complete it, but they can see some really good ideas there in the um, that you've written in the margin or somewhere, they'll give you marks for it. If you cross it through, they're not allowed to look at it. So just bear that in mind, OK? So do your brainstorming, jot your ideas down. So this was my brainstorm. I had loss of jobs for the taxi drivers. Um, uh, the safety in terms of uh, what about um, electric cars? So in the case of a, a, a regular car driver, if someone has to get hit, um, you know, who would who would make the decision about whether you'd swerve to knock down an old person or swerve to knock down a child? Um, how safe would the people be in terms of being tracked? Um, what about the the background of the programmer? Uh, what impact could that have on 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 how it's programmed? What about hacking the taxi to make it crash? What about the loss of human touch? What about Mrs. Smith, who's been picked up to go to bingo um, at two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon for the last 20 years, and suddenly a computerised car turns up? She'd be terrified. Poor Mrs. Smith. Um, what about uh, the, digital di the digital divide? Those who haven't got a phone to order these, uh, these, these e electronic taxis, or who don't know how to, how to use them. Um, what about the manufacturers? Well, that's the car manufacturers. Can you see how thinking about the stakeholders here is the key? Thinking about every single person that this problem touches. That is how you answer this question. And there's a pretty good chance that will work well for the one that you do as well. Uh, so the manufacturers could talk about them, that they're going to be really happy because they've been making lots of e-taxes. So lots of profit, bigger companies, building new premises. All of that's great. The drivers, well, it sucks for them, doesn't it? They haven't got a job. They have to go and do something else because uh, it's, chances are if, if e-taxis are being rolled out in this part of the country, it'll be happening elsewhere. So suddenly taxi driver might become a profession that's done by robots. What about the, um, so electric, better for the environment. Um, but what about um, where, the, where the electricity comes from? But what about in manufacturing these cars? I'm now down to here. In manufacturing these cars, um, you've got this notion of um, the raw materials. Whoops, over here. Finite resources, bits of gold, nickel, cadmium, silver, all that sort of stuff. Um, workers' rights, supply chain. Yeah, what about where these precious metals are taken from, these mines in Brazil and Argentina? Are they looked after? Have they got workers' rights? Have they got health care? Do they get looked after? Should we care? Our phones that we use to do everything? Who's, who's had their hands on these? Hmm. The more you investigate, the more you realise that slave labour may well have been involved here, um, as well as criminality. So those are the sorts of areas that you could consider for this question. Uh, so then, 
link your brainstorm to paragraph headings. Is anything missing? And then if you need to brainstorm again, if not, go back and do it. Now, obviously, I've done this in super at super high speed and you're not going to have in 10 minutes. You won't have time to do all of these actions slowly and deliberately. But can you see now that the person marking this, even though this isn't my final submission for the essay question that I wrote, I've said something about all of these areas and I've related it. So have I said something about all the areas? Tick. Have I related it back to the scenario about taxi drivers? Tick. Have I argued both sides? That's something else we need to think about. So electric better for the environment, finite resources. So electric's good, electric's bad. OK, so I've talked about both sides of it. Who's responsible? That's the legal side of it. Oh, yeah, for accidents. Who's responsible? Is it the taxi company? Is it the person in the taxi? How would that work? Hmm, interesting. Um, ethical, loss of jobs. Um, old versus young. Uh, cultural, human touch, safety peers, fears, digital divide. Do mention digital divide. Mention it. Um, and then think about the stakeholders as, as well. OK. Then link your answers to the context and make sure that you've, that you've talked about all of the areas in the context and the scenario. Make sure you link it back. OK. So can you see here the stuff in blue is where I've linked it back to the scenario. E-taxi, e-taxi, drivers. Drivers' knowledge, um, manufacturers of taxis, e-taxis. I've talked about taxis. I haven't just given a generic answer. I've only answered their question. That's what you need to do. All right. Argue both sides uh, and then push on. And then the last thing is you end up with something a little bit like this. Um, old taxis being recycled are too expensive. And so I've come up with some positives and some negatives that it's great that the taxis are better for the environment, bad, but bad if they come from fossil fuels, finite resources, bad. Um, old taxis not recycled as it's too expensive. They just go go into landfill or go into a, you know, a scrapyard somewhere. Um, Self-driving cars will be safer overall. Safe dry, uh, self driving cars can't drink, they don't they can't take drugs, they can't speed, um, they don't go for joyride, they don't try and do donuts, they're quite well behaved, you know, unlike humans. Um, sharing economy, think about Uber, how this could work. It could be, but it'd be much cheaper for the customers. Um, how safe would it be? Question mark on there about privacy, uh, lack of human touch. Um, you could talk about the fact that some taxi drivers um, have attack their customers or indeed some taxi drivers have been attacked by their customers which I think happens more often um, so it could be safer for the taxi drivers but they haven't got a job that's not so good um, then what about the manufacturer of the new taxis good taxi drivers bad taxi firms good government's good because taxes are being raised because things are being sold customers good because it's cheaper bad if you're uh, 82 and don't want to be driven around by a robot manufacturers of traditional taxis bad because no one's buying their products anymore unless they're making e-taxes okay after all of that you end up with your final essay which looks something like this and there's no need for me to go through it because I've kind of covered absolutely everything on here that is a massively whistle-stop tour of uh, of this topic but you really need to think about the system you can put in place to get the marks I'll leave this up here while I'm chatting in case anyone can work out whether this is A, B or C. Uh, so that can be your, your, your exercise as I'm, as I'm going through this. But I would, I would summarise this particular live stream by talking about the importance of you relating um, to the scenario. Make sure that you talk about the scenario in your answer. Don't just think, I'll write down everything I know about environmental things and global warming and blah, 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 blah. No one cares. Make sure that you relate your answer to the scenario they've given you, to that question they've given you. Secondly, have you argued both sides? It doesn't matter if you don't believe in it. No one cares. The fact that you don't agree that uh, that, ele that electric cars would be bad because uh, people will lose their jobs, that's your opinion. But still... It's a positive and a negative. So make sure you're doing positive, negative, positive, negative, And you're talking about the scenario and that you're 
and, and that you've covered all the different areas of the question. Right. 59 minutes past six. We have done the hour. So that is me. I'm going to check out and I will see you all in one week's time. Uh, please do let me know if you succeed in downloading the uh, Knowledge Organizer. Guys, have an amazing week. Uh, don't work too hard, uh, but do do some work because uh, it'll make life much easier for you. Take care. See you next week. Bye-bye.